Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much for being here today. And I'm going to provide some remarks in just a minute, but I want to start out by recognizing the former first lady and my current uh, spouse, and hopefully forever spouse, <laughs> Mary Palenti. She's driven four hours to be with us today, and she came down from the Twin Cities because she thought this gathering was so important in terms of the issue presented, which is the role of family and family-related issues in our country. And I really love her very much, and I really appreciate the effort that she's made not only to be here today, but has made to serve Minnesota and to serve this cause uh, through her whole life. I, I want to just present to you uh, Mary Palenti. Is this, uh, there we go. Um, I, first, I just want to tell you all how much I appreciate your taking the time to come out on a Monday and to care and to listen and to be so engaged in the process. As you well know, and you have heard countless times, I'm sure, throughout the course of your life, it matters deeply that you are engaged and that you are listening carefully and that you are making discerning choices. Our country and the future of our country depends on that. And it is a beautiful thing that it begins in Iowa. And I will tell you that uh, Tim is exactly right. There is much I wish I could do. I wish I could do more travel with him. I wish I could be with him often. We have two children. And so certainly my obligation resides first and foremost at home. But this was a very important day and I wanted to pull alongside best I'm able. So I'll be here and also over in Sioux Center. I did want to come to Pella at some point. I never expected in my lifetime that it would be in early February when it's chilly. My 92-year-old mother says I should come at tulip time, which is when she has been here before. But um, this is a place I have wanted to come for a very long time. My grandmother and my grandmother's mother were raised here in Pella. My grandmother was baptized in the Des Moines River just outside Pella by her own grandfather who was a pastor here, uh, Levi Fosdick. And so it is just um, from my heart to yours, it's really poignant that uh, we are here in Pella today and I'm happy to be here and I just wanna give you one quick comment about my husband. You, of course, would predict that his wife would be here telling you that I think he's absolutely terrific. He'll speak to issues more broadly regarding policy, what he has done, his history, his strong record, and those are very, very important. I know you'll get an opportunity to ask him about that. But I did want to tell you that after being married to him for 23 years, I know his heart probably better than anyone else on earth. And I know all of his strengths, I know his shortcomings too, so, um, I, but I won't share those. He's not perfect, um, but he is completely fabulous. He is a deeply kind-hearted person. He is a deeply caring spouse. He has been incredible to my mother. If you can love your mother-in-law and still be a fierce Scrabble player and he's not shy about beating her, he is just a all-around wonderful human being. But in addition to being the kindest man that I have ever known, he is also the strongest. So it is my pleasure to be here in support of him now and forever. So my husband, Governor Tim Blanty. coming out on a, on a weekday to be part of this uh, presentation and look forward to your questions as well. I want to start out by thanking the family leader organization, Bob Vanderplatz, is somebody who I've had a chance to get to know. Mary and I had a chance to get to know he and Darla over at dinner not long ago. And Bob, we really appreciate your leadership and commitment to these issues and to the organization more broadly. Thank you to the family leader organization for creating this forum, elevating and highlighting the family as a focus for discussion and debate. It's really important, and I'm glad that you're in that role. And let's give Bob a round of applause. And thank you very much. Well, this organization, as you know, is designed to try to educate and raise awareness and mobilize people around family issues. And as Bob mentioned, that can range from economic issues to marriage and life issues, and really all issues affect the family in one way or another. And so I want to just start with uh, today the notion that as you have a chance to go through this forum, whether it's me or others up here, you're going to be asking, well, who are these individuals and what do they believe? And importantly, why do they believe it? And of course, policy and the particulars of policy are so important in that regard, but 
Also under the hood of that are the, the compass settings and the heart and gut connections that people have as to why they're presenting those positions in. Not only do they talk about those positions, but do they have experience and results and fortitude in standing up for them and getting them done, whether that be in Iowa or Minnesota as well. And through the efforts that we have through my Freedom First PAC that uh, we have in Iowa and other places across the country, we lend voice and support to candidates and groups who share our views about these family issues and try to get more people elected who share that perspective as well. And I know that many of you have been involved in those efforts, and I want to say thank you for being involved and participating. Now, there's a Minnesota story that I like to share. It's a true story, but some of you remember Bill Moyers. Uh, he's uh, from Minnesota, and at one time he served as the press secretary for then-President Lyndon Baines Johnson. And as the story goes, they were in the cabinet room of the White House. And uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson asked Moyers, he said, Moyers, why don't you start the meeting out with a prayer? And Bill Moyers was down at the other end of this big, long table in the cabinet room. And Bill Moyers began, began to pray somewhat softly. And LBJ kind of bellowed out. He said, we can't hear you at this end of the table. And Bill Moyers said, well, with all due respect, sir, it wasn't you I was talking to. Uh, <laughs> And that's how they started their meeting, but it's also a good place to start a discussion about our country and about public policy because it leads to a discussion of who are we talking to, what do we believe, and why do we believe it. And I think it's important to just go back and step back from where we are today in this, the immediacy of the issues of today and put a frame around how did this start and why did it start and on what basis was it built? And in that regard, our nation was founded under God. And this isn't just the musings of a politician who comes through Pella, Iowa. But of course, this has been a celebrated tradition and principle and value of our country since its founding, not just in speeches and rhetoric, but embedded in the founding documents of this nation. And there are many, many eloquent examples of this. Of course, they include the Declaration of Independence, which says, we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. And of course, 49 of the 50 states have constitutions that stop and acknowledge God in their constitutions as a framing reference point. I know you have in Iowa, as we do in Minnesota. In our case, in the very first sentence, in the very first paragraph of the Minnesota Constitution, the preamble, it says this, we the people of Minnesota, grateful to God for our civil and religious liberties. And then it goes on from there to talk about the importance of perpetuating those blessings to future generations. And so the founders of my state, the founders of your state, the founders of our country thought it was first most important to stop and to pause and to acknowledge God and to thank God for the blessings he has given this country and as they started out on the journey of charting the course for our states and for our country they wanted people to remember that's where it began and we of course embrace that to this day we celebrate that to this day and if that's a founding perspective as it is then it leads to certain conclusions and values and principles and perspectives even in the challenges of our day, and we need to apply them to the challenges of our day. So what are those things, and how does that tie into the discussion here today? Well, there's an unease in the country, as you know, particularly about our future. And when people are uneasy, they start to search for what's a better way, what's a better answer. The NBC Wall Street Journal organization came out with a poll just a couple weeks ago or less, and they asked in the poll, what country do you think will be the dominant country in the world in 20 years? And you know what the answer was? China. China. And the people who were polled weren't Chinese. They weren't people from other countries. They were Americans. And so for the first time, as far as I can tell, in the history of that poll, or similar polls, 
when asked what country do you believe will be leading the world, be the dominant country in 20 years, the answer did not come back from Americans, the United States of America. It came back China. That is one measure of the unease that people feel about our future. They feel that perhaps the America that was is slipping away. And that comes in various forms. There's an economic concern, obviously, with the economy and unemployment and economic uncertainty. But there's also a sense that maybe things aren't together like they used to be, that maybe families aren't together like they were before, or neighborhoods don't function or aren't together like they were before, or community or charity and places like that. So people are wondering, what, what is going on? Why does this seem to be slipping away? Which leads to the point I want to leave you with today. It's not slipping away. Nothing is inevitable. Our future can be influenced and must be influenced by brave, courageous, faithful people who understand and see the challenge and are willing to rise up, roll up our sleeves, and get involved in the political process and get this country pointed back on the direction that we know has worked. It is time-tested based on the values and principles that made this nation great for all these decades and all these centuries. And it starts with these principles. Number one, we can't be a great country unless we're a good country. We need to restore America and America's greatness by restoring America's goodness. And we will again be prosperous when we are first good. And we also get back to the principles and values that made us great, both economically and otherwise. So, Acknowledging God, turning towards God, not turning away from God, is an important part of the discussion, an important starting point for all of these values. Now, beyond all of that, where does this come from? What can we do about it? Where do we go from here beyond acknowledging God in terms of our public policy? Well, first of all, we have an opportunity as concerned Iowans, concerned Minnesotans, to influence the issues of our time. And of course, as we think about the family, as Bob mentioned, the family is impacted by almost every issue that the leaders of Iowa, the leaders of Minnesota uh, come up with. Starting with, you can't have family life unless you have life. And so respect for life is embraced in our founding documents. It is a cornerstone value of our society. It needs to be a cornerstone policy for our government. As I led Minnesota as governor and majority leader, I was proud to help lead the efforts for the pro-life movement in my state. And we made some very good progress. Now, there's much work yet to be done. But laws will change and court decisions will change when we change hearts and minds. So part of the opportunity and part of the responsibility for people in public service is to reach out and explain why our views are the ones that will be best for Iowa and best for the country. So when I was governor, we proposed and signed into law, just as an example, women's right to know legislation that said if you're considering an abortion, uh, we would like to have a, a waiting period of at least 24 hours and some information provided to people before they go to the procedure so they can be fully informed. We had a piece of legislation known as the Positive Alternatives to Abortion Act so we could give uh, individuals in that circumstance another pathway besides abortion as an alternative. We passed legislation relating to the pain that uh, a fetus may ex uh, experience as the abortion procedure is performed and other issues as well. And so our pro-life movement in Minnesota, while the cause continues, we we're able to make good progress during that time, during my time as governor. And of course the family depends on parents coming together and having a traditional family, celebrating the traditional family and respecting that and continuing that tradition in our laws. And I know that has been such a prominent issue in Iowa in these days and in these months and the last few years. But I've been a strong proponent of making sure we send the message in our words and in our policies and in our laws that marriage should be defined between a man and a woman. I was the co-author of legislation in Minnesota when I was in the legislature to define it that way within our Minnesota uh, laws, and that has been on the books since that time. 
But I know that you believe, or most of you believe, and I do as well, that that's a cornerstone of our families. It's a cornerstone of our society. It's a cornerstone of, of how we parent and, and the, the experience that a child has to have a mom and a dad. That we know that's the best experience and the best upbringing for a child. And there are many other issues as well besides abortion, of course, and traditional marriage. Let me just touch on a few. When I was growing up in South St. Paul, Minnesota, which was the home of the world's largest meatpacking towns, uh, my mom died when I was 16. My dad lost his job for a while, not too long after that. And so life looked like it was going to be very challenging. But I knew one thing, that education was the pathway out for me. And the commitment to education would be so important in my life. But we know as we think about opportunities in people's lives that education needs to be reflective of the fact that parents are in charge, that parents are the ones that are in the driver's seat for what's best for their children and their family. We have a commitment in this country to try to get everyone educated, but we don't need to get everyone educated through a government monopoly system. And so doing all that we can to create choices and alternatives in the school arena that allows parents to pick the pathway that's best for their child in light of their value system, in light of their background, in light of their learning aptitudes, in light of their interest in learning areas. So that means within the public school system, we should be for as much choice within that system as possible. We should be for allowing students to have the ability to go to a private school if that's their choice, if that's what their parents feel is right for them. We should offer as much variety and choice as possible in charter schools. We should encourage and applaud our homeschoolers who, of course, uh, do remarkably good work and produce remarkably good results. There's opportunities in online learning. We should push and promote as much school choice and parental control of school choice and a child's education as possible. And then lastly, I want to just discuss with you one other issue and then I'll leave the rest of the time for questions. And that is the issue of the economy uh, more broadly. Families, of course, are feeling pressured for lots of different reasons. One of which is just the uncertainty and the pressure that comes with needing to make sure that a mom and a dad have the resources necessary to take care of their children. And it's one of the biggest concerns, of course, and biggest worries of parents all across the state and all across the country. But we have a country where the era of being able to just be able to miss the educational run and still be able to go out and get a decent job at a living wage with benefits has gone by. And so it's so important, as I mentioned a minute ago, that children get educated, but we also have to have this be the kind of state and country where jobs want to grow. The best thing that we can do for our fellow citizens is to provide them economic opportunity so they can have the stability and the confidence and the assurance that they'll be able to take care of their families in a way that they hope for and feel is best for them. So we need to be able to ask and answer the question. What are those things that we can do to make it most likely that jobs are going to grow, not be discouraged? That we're going to make it more likely that businesses are going to start, not close? What are those things that we can do to make it more likely that job growth and payroll will expand, not contract? And when we ask and answer that question, the best answers don't come from the politicians, most of whom have been in uh, the public sector their whole lives. The best answers come from the people who actually do that day in and day out, who are the ones who start businesses and grow businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, all across this country. And when you ask them, what can we do to make it more likely that you'll grow jobs in Iowa or Minnesota or the country, they'll say this, governor or legislator or member of Congress, you have to make the burdens on me lighter, not heavier. You have to do things to encourage me to take those risks and to invest and add employees, not to discourage me. So when it comes to taxes, when it comes to regulation, when it comes to energy costs, when it comes to uh, the cost associated with permitting or litigation or the time and expense it relates to get all various government approvals, you got to make those things easier, not more difficult, because I'm competing against the county down the road or the state up the street or the country across the world, and my burdens and costs have to be competitive. And if you price me out of the market, uh, jobs are going to contract, not grow. 
And we need to be making sure that we enact policies that are more job friendly. You cannot be pro-jobs and anti-business. That's like being pro-egg and anti-chicken. That doesn't work very well. So I'm a very strong supporter of doing those things that will ignite our economy in the private sector, not by just having everything being grown through the government sector, as you've seen. And I'll just close with one last story. At another moment in time in our nation's recent history, there was a lot of unease in the country, sort of like there is now. The year was 1980, and in fact, after the election of 1980, in the inauguration of 1981, on a kind of a gray, overcast, cold day in Washington, D.C., a new president was elected and about to be sworn in. And he came out of the United States Capitol, and his name was Ronald Reagan. Of course, yesterday we celebrated his 100th birthday in this country, and he's going to go down as one of the greatest presidents in the history of the country. But he came to the podium on that gray day to take the oath of office as the president of the United States of America. And he recalled in a later memoir that when he stepped to the podium, he felt as if the clouds had parted a little bit and some sunshine had came down on the podium area, and he felt enveloped in kind of a beam of warmth from the sun that hit just in the moment that he was about to be sworn in. And as he turned to take the oath of office, they flipped open the family Bible. His mom, Nell, had, uh, had it at one time. And he put his hand on the Bible to be sworn in as the President of the United States. And his hand was on the page that contained 2 Chronicles 7.14. And that passage, as you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, says, of course, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Now what a remarkable passage. And by the way, I'm told that Ronald Reagan's mom, Nell, in the margin of that Bible, wrote something to the effect of, a great passage for healing the nation. So that was the passage that Ronald Reagan's hand was on or near when he was sworn in as President of the United States. But think about that passage. It doesn't say, those people over there. It says, if my people, people who are called by his name, have a responsibility to be involved, and starting with being humble, it's not always easy in politics to be humble because people get all this, all this activity and commotion, but it starts with that perspective. It also starts with being earnest in our prayers and petitions and, of course, acknowledging God and to turn towards Him and away from other things. I think if we as individuals do that, we and our families do that, if we as a nation do that and have the values and common sense that comes with that, reflected in our policies and our public debate, then our nation will be on its way towards healing. Ronald Reagan understood that. I think the people of this country still understand that. This is a good country. It's not just a great country. It's a, also a good-hearted country. People know where that comes from. It comes from these foundational values and principles. And if we can hang on to them and get back to them, celebrate them and elevate in this moment of time and apply them to the issues of our time, we will get this country back on track to be a great nation with a very bright future. And you're a huge part of that. Thank you for listening today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.